Hello and greetings everyone and welcome back to this year's World Aquatic Animal Day on the impact of our human activities on aquatic animals. This is a project of the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative and the Animal Law Clinic at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law here in Portland, Oregon. My name is Jackson Moffitt. I am a law student and legal intern with the Animal Law Clinic here at the law school and a member of one of our partnering organizations, ORCA. My pronouns are he and him. Thank you for turning in, tuning into this session on plastic pollution and marine life, opportunities for action. Oceanic Global's program director, Cassia Patel, will outline the scope of the marine plastic pollution issue in specific relation to the impact on marine life throughout the food chain, including seabirds, often forgotten members of ocean ecosystems, in addition to the resulting health and social impacts. Cassia will also take some time to highlight actions we can all take on our own, lives, families, communities, and businesses to tackle our plastic pollution crisis and be part of the solution. We are extremely excited to have Cassia Patel from Oceana Global, somebody who's really been a pioneer and really dedicated her life to banning single-use plastics from the ocean and definitely somebody that I've always looked up to. Uh, but before we dive into this session, there are some formalities. Uh, this, is, this session is, is a Zoom webinar format so you will not be able to see yourself or other attendees, but only our speakers. You will be muted for the session, but can submit your comments and questions as I will explain in a moment. Please note that this session is being recorded and we hope it will be available to view in a few weeks. Links to the videos will be available on our website, www.worldaquaticanimalday.org and on the Center for Animal Law Studies YouTube channel. For further information about today's events, please check out our website or Facebook page, which you can find by searching for World Aquatic Animal Day. After the speaker's presentation, we hope to have time for a brief Q&A. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A box located in the control panel on your screen. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Cassia Patel. Cassia Patel is a program director of Oceanic Global, a global NGO that engages new audiences in ocean conservation. Her work with Oceana Global includes overseeing their grassroots initiatives, policy reform efforts, educational programming, and managing the Oceanic Standard, a free set of industry-specific resources for adopting sustainable practices that meet both business and environmental needs with a focus on eliminating single-use plastics and improving waste management. Cassia has formal training as an environmental engineer, underwater research biologist, and in sustainable design. Well, without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it over to you, Cassia. Cassia, take it away. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Jackson. It is, it is so lovely to be here on World Aquatic Animal Day. Um, I will briefly show you where I am, just in, in the spirit of today. Um, we're sitting here in Maui on the north side, um, looking at, uh, at the ocean where whales have been passing by as they're uh, proceeding with their migration. So uh, just in honor of, of World Aquatic Animal Day. And if there is, um, just as a point of housekeeping, if there is, if you have any difficulty hearing me, just let me know and I can move away from the wind. Um, so, so so, please do, do let me know, Jackson. But I'm thrilled to be here. My name is Cassia Patel. I'm the program director of Oceanic Global. And Oceanic Global, and if we can go to the next slide, Jackson. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, so Oceanic Global is a nonprofit that focuses on engaging new audiences in ocean conservation. We really focus on behavior change. So we work at two levels of action, one more at the community side and, and the grassroots side of action, looking at how we can engage individuals, families, communities in changing their behaviors. Um, <clears throat> we have a grassroots hub program with volunteer chapters essentially in New York, LA, London, and Barcelona. And these hubs each focus on what they feel is most contextually relevant in their location to take action, whether that's youth empowerment and education, policy reform, um, creative <clears throat> communication, community building, hosting film screenings, et cetera. Um, it's so really exciting to see how, how you know, you can empower leaders to, be, to take action in their own communities. On the other side, we do work at the industry level and with businesses and to help businesses set highest uh, with everything we do focus initially on tackling single use plastics and waste management. So we help businesses to eliminate single use plastics throughout their operations. We focus primarily on food service businesses. So working with restaurants and hotels and music festivals, and sports stadiums, as well as office spaces. 
um, to help them get to that point and to highlight all of the incredible solutions that are out there and all of the innovation that exists to help us um, in that journey as well. Um, but we do think of plastic and waste as a gateway to then take further action um, to choose responsible and sustainable food procurement, local and plant-based food, um, <clears throat> as well as sustainable seafood options there and reducing energy and water consumption, reducing emissions. So starting with plastic and waste as a gateway to then take that further action. All right, and if we go to the next slide. And this is what I was outlining with the, the two pillars of action at the grassroots side and the industry side, both with we see feeding into um, action at the policy level. And I'll be speaking a bit more about, um, today I'll be speaking a bit more about our industry solutions as we go through. Um, here to the next slide. So this is a fun one, just <laughs> grounding us in, in our love for the planet um, and our love for the earth um, and, and where we are in space. Um, if you go to the next slide. This is a beautiful uh, mandala mosaic depiction of uh, phytoplankton. And so recognizing that the ocean is actually responsible for most of the oxygen that we breathe on Earth. So every second breath comes from the sea. It comes from these small, incredible microorganisms <clears throat> as they photosynthesize. And these were some of the first photosynthesizing organisms on the planet. And so um, while we, our work does more explicitly focus on the ocean, we also just recognize that all systems are interconnected. What happens on land impacts the, the ocean. What happens in the ocean impacts our life on land. And um, <clears throat> today, as we think about aquatic animals, we can also just recognize their place in that, in that broader system. Um, if you go to the next slide. And for us, that makes sense because we think of this as a blue planet. 70% of our Earth's surface is ocean. Um, life came from the ocean. So um, it just seems right to be, to be thinking about and focusing on um, the life that is in there and, um, and how that relates to life on land as well. Um, and the next slide, this is highlighting a, um, a, a beautiful artistic project called Bella Gaia, which is visualizing NASA data of the Earth's atmosphere and ocean currents and um, also just continuing to show how things are so interconnected. Um, our ocean is actually also our temperature distribution system. So the ocean is the reason, um, the ocean and ocean currents um, are the reason that we can, can manage temperature on the planet. So it prevents hot places from being too hot, cold places from being too cold, um, and just allows for that, for that heat transfer essentially. So it's our, our giant heat transfer system on the planet and we're very reliant on that um, for making places um, livable for us. Um, all right, so the next problem, the next uh, slide. So today we're gonna be, I'll be talking a little bit more about marine plastic pollution specifically and how that does impact marine life. Um, but then also I'll spend a lot of time focusing on how we can take action um, and, and what we can be doing and, and how we can prevent and rechart re the course of that challenge. The next slide. So we have, at this point, actually, a recent study shows that we have 11 million metric tons of plastic ending up in our ocean every year. Um, and pairing that with the fact that 93% of fish stocks are fully fished or depleted, um, it's no wonder that a lot of projections estimate that we'll have more plastic than fish by 2050. We've even seen some projections estimating by 2040, um, as we've just continued to ramp up plastic production. Uh, but plastic is unique in that we've only mass produced single-use plastics in particular, um, we've only mass-produced this material over the past 60 or 70 years. So um, it's just a few generations, and it's something that has not been a part of our story um, in, the long, in the long term, which just means that we can innovate around that. We can see what we were doing before that. We can find alternative solutions um, to match new technology with old systems uh, to move away from, from this problem. So I think that that's what certainly gives me hope. Um, if you go to the next slide. This is another um, artistic uh, demonstration, though, as we're talking about 11 million metric, ton metric tons of plastic entering our ocean every year. Um, that's actually almost two truckloads of garbage truckloads of plastic entering the ocean every 60 seconds. Um, this is a visual visualization of what one garbage truckload looks like. So um, you can imagine that that would just be a bit larger. Um, and on the next slide. This does impact our this does impact marine life This impacts marine ecosystems. Um, one million marine animals are actually killed by plastic pollution every year. Um, a greater number are caught and entangled. Um, and um, yeah, actually, we'll go to the next slide first. 
And this does include fishing gear. Um, and I saw that, that you'll be tweeting conspiracy later on. So you'll definitely hear more about that. But between 500,000 to a million tons of fishing gear uh, alone enters the ocean every year. And um, in many cases, it's because of storms um, and other practices, it does get lost at sea. And um, as it's designed is very, uh, you know, very effective at entangling marine life and marine animals. Um, on the next slide. So the number of species that have been affected by plastic debris um, has doubled since 1997. Um, so as I was saying that, you know, this is a recent, relatively recent problem in the way that we've been mass producing plastics. Um, you can see that the impacts on, um, on marine life, and we'll also talk later about the impacts on human health, um, have only been exponentially increasing as, as, that, um, as that really comes to a head. So um, according to a, a recent study, this impacts 557 species, um, plastic debris impacts 557 species. Um, the next slide, what's challenging and harmful also about plastic pollution, not only in the entanglement um, aspects, it, is that it's also mistaken as food by animals, and um, especially as plastic breaks up into microplastics when, when it's exposed to the sun, to wave action, to, um, to, to essentially, yeah, to, to being in the ocean and to um, so that exposure, it breaks up into smaller and smaller microplastics. And these are, are really harmful because as they're consumed at the base of the food chain, they accumulate um, as they go up each trophic level and each level of the food chain until um, <clears throat> you can end up with you know, a seabird like this that has a stomach entirely full of plastic. I think um, people might be familiar with images of whales with their stomachs full of plastic as well. Um, and so this is what... what harmful is that it actually causes animals to starve because though their stomachs are full, none of this is nutritious value for animals. And so um, they're actually then, then starving um, to death in that case. Uh, so, and seabirds maybe are not a common, commonly thought of as uh, marine species, but, um, but yeah, but seabirds absolutely are reliant and part of ocean ecosystems there um, and heavily impacted by this crisis. But in addition to that, just recognizing um, and highlighting the, the issue of microplastics, in addition, I just also wanted to mention that microplastics, when they travel through the water column, they act essentially as magnets. And so they aggregate harmful chemicals um, that we've also been dumping into, into the ocean. Toxic chemicals, runoff, um, et cetera, are then um, aggregated and, and collected by these small microplastic fragments traveling through the water. And so as they're consumed by marine creatures and as they're consumed by, um, through the food chain, they're also then accumulating um, the content of those toxic chemicals. And so what's also dangerous, not only does this significantly impact marine life and ecosystems, but this is a, a public health crisis because we're eating these microplastics whenever we eat seafood, whenever we eat salt, um, it's in our drinking water, it's in produce, um, it's in beer. And so actually 80, 83% of drinking water worldwide has been shown to have plastic contamination. And globally on average, we each eat a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Um, we're still figuring out what that actually does to the human body and, and the impact that, that has. And what we do know is that there are chemicals in plastic that are endocrine disruptors, which basically interrupts the body's ability to communicate with itself. And so this can cause developmental impacts, this can cause cancers. Uh, a recent book called Countdown by Shauna Swan actually highlights how the consumption of plastic and associated chemicals is decreasing fertility in men uh, so in many ways, this does impact the next generation, um, and it's something that we do need to grapple with very seriously as a public health, as a human rights challenge um, at every stage of the, of, of the process from extraction as oil and gas to waste disposal. Plastic is impacting marginalized and low-income communities, um, impacting, impacting and polluting the air and the water, um, <clears throat> preventing and a highest quality of life at all those stages. And so it, it is a massive problem. <laughs> I, know, I know it's a total downer. Um, it's a massive problem at all levels, uh, but it, there is, but what, what is hopeful, and as I've mentioned earlier in that, because it is this design flaw that we're using a material that we've built to last forever for items that we're throwing away after a single use, there's just, there's a discrepancy there. And so this, because plastic is such an incredible material, we should be using it for building materials and long lasting items rather than straws and cups and bottles and bags, which have an average lifetime of less than 15 minutes. And so that's where we can really 
begin to take more immediate action in our own lives and businesses and how we can start to, to shift the needle there and remove the plastic that's clogging up our waterways and communities um, and, and reduce the reliance on that whole system um, and cycle of production. Um, if you go to the next slide, just, rec just highlighting here, it's the time to take action, but we have all of the tools that we need to do so. So on the next slide, I'm now going to start talking more about um, what it is that we do um, as we as we navigate and, and start talking more about solutions. So um, I highlighted a little bit about our industry solutions program earlier. Uh, this has multiple components. So on one side, we have open source resources on our website. We're, we are at oceanic.global and under the solutions tab, you'll see more about the program and, and the resources that we have available for different industries. Um, I mentioned that we work with restaurants and hotels. We work within the hospitality sphere. We also do a lot of work with events typically, um, as well as the professional sports world, uh, office spaces, um, uh, travel and tourism too. So working with beyond just with hotels, but also with um, destinations. And so we've, we've been working at the island level um, and, and I, can, I can talk more about that as we go. Um, and then as well as with, um, with, with music. And so with artists and tours and concerts and venues, and um, these are all places that people interact with. And so fundamentally, for, when we think about behavior change, if we're able to change the practices of what a hotel or a sports stadium is doing, from our theory of change, we hope that that then inspires everybody who comes to a sports game or a concert or um, visits their favorite restaurant or hotel is then inspired to change their own lifestyle practices at home and in, in continuity, as well, especially once they can see how that is role modeled and, and uh, be inspired by that. And so just also want to mention we do um, in these resources that we do make them locally specific and, and regionally relevant. So we do have resources currently for the US, the UK, Spain, Barbados, um, we have localized resources for Mexico and um, uh, and Amsterdam and the Netherlands, and then the Aeolian Islands in Italy, which is one of our destination-wide projects um, that I'll speak more about. Uh, and in each of these resources, just to give you a sense, and, and you'll see if you if you poke around, we basically highlight um, any policy that's relevant. So if there's any bans on single-use plastics, that, that's another hopeful piece. That there are so many. Um, policies popping up to ban specific single-use plastic items that are habitually used in these in these regions and um, industries. Um, and then we also talk about waste management infrastructure that is available and uh, services that are available to support businesses and so that they understand what's um, accessible in their region or what's required in their region. And then we do highlight specifically item by item, straws, cups, bottles, cutlery, takeaway containers, we highlight and link directly through to vendors that are offering alternatives to single-use plastics. Um, we promote and prioritize highlighting reusable systems. So wherever there are reusable takeaway containers or reusable coffee cups or um, cups programs that could be used in stadiums and festivals. And then from there, highlighting where um, there are single-use or disposable items that fit within existing waste management infrastructure. So that's where it's always so important to figure out like, if you're sourcing something, where does that go at the end of life? And just to make sure that, that um, there's, there's a full thread there. Uh, so we have these resources, but then we also do offer support to businesses to help them reach their goals. And, um, and so if you go to the next slide, uh, we can highlight that we have a badge system to recognize businesses for what it is that they've achieved. So as we work with the business, we help them set their goals. We do a full assessment of everything it is that they're sourcing, those straws, cups, bottles, um, to see which items are single-use plastics. And then we'll start putting them in touch with alternatives. We'll start brainstorming around solutions and and supporting them in, in that journey and transition. Ultimately, um, as we can as we achieve those goals, we can then award them with one of the relevant badges here. And so we have four tiers of badges, the first one being straw free. So just helping businesses eliminate single use plastic straws um, as, as a gateway and an entrance. And the whole the system that we have here is designed to celebrate and acknowledge um, that progress is a, continuating, a continuation and a journey. And so to be able to celebrate businesses at all levels of that journey. Um, the second tier is sustainability steward. And this is awarded to businesses that eliminate three forms of single-use plastics, which could include straws. So really getting, you know, building from existing progress. Um, the, set, the third tier is called Ocean Champion, and this is for eliminating six forms of single-use plastics. Um, it also, we also do require that businesses are meeting or exceeding waste management um, regulation. 
So if there is a requirement, for example, for a business to recycle or to compost, um, then we'll make sure that they're meeting those those local requirements and ideally going above and beyond and, and thinking about food donation or other ways to reduce waste. And the highest level badge is plastic free. And this is awarded to businesses that fully eliminate single use plastics um, throughout their operations. FOH and BOH are front of house and back of house. And just because we work so much in food service, what that really means is what's consumer facing um, versus what's happening behind the scenes in the kitchens and the storerooms and um, in the laundry room for hotels. And so, um, so making sure that we're looking holistically throughout. Uh, so on the next slide, we're highlighting where we have businesses around the world. And actually this has now increased um, since we launched the program in April of 2018, we've worked with 400 businesses uh, across 26 countries. And we've done that really with the support of 60 uh, consultants and implementation partners that we work with on the ground in each of these places who are um, who we're, we're essentially offering the tools and framework of our program um, as they engage businesses in their community. And so that's been really exciting to see how people get excited to, to lead these efforts in their own regions and communities and um, get others involved that way as well. Um, and at this point as well, we, this uh, just to, to note quickly, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing at the industry level does feed into policy. Um, two examples I'll share. One, our work in New York, uh, where we began by tackling straws, really led to um, and, and gave the city council the confidence that they needed to propose the New York City straw bill, um, the ban on single plastic straws in New York City, which we're hoping will get voted in um, soon. That's still in process. But as business, as the government was able to see that, you know, 100 businesses went ahead and eliminated some use plastic straws, they had marketable alternatives, it was possible, and um, then they had the confidence to move forward with that legislation. And on the opposite side of that, in Barbados, we actually came into, um, we were we were working with a lot of different community partners on the ground there who asked us to come in and support because they had announced a nationwide ban on single use plastics already. And so um, there, there is an existing nationwide ban on, on 10 specific single use plastic items, um, things like straws and cups and uh, cartons and things that are commonly used in, in, in these industries. Um, yet the businesses were not familiar with what the legislation um, included and with how to how to go about that, how to make that a reality. So we came in really to provide that education, to celebrate the local solutions available on island, um, and to and to make sure that that could be that could have meaning once that policy was in place. And so um, so it really can come in at both levels. But essentially, just highlighting that um, as these policies go into place, it's, it's really important to have buy-in um, at all levels. You you do need those political mechanisms. You do need the industries to be to be pioneers and to be leaders and to be taking this on. And um, you also do need the grassroots support and the um, the attention and the focus, uh, which is ultimately what drives both the businesses and uh, the policy. So so that, that action is and, and intention is required at all levels there. Um, so on this slide, we're talking about um, our COVID plastic free reopening guidelines that we created. And this was in a coalition effort, essentially starting about a year ago, um, in March of last year, the plastics industry came in very loudly and strongly at the beginning of the COVID pandemic in the US, especially um, to say that single use plastics is the safest and only option to combat COVID. Um, and at this point, we know that it's not true. Uh, we know that there are many ways that reusable surfaces and materials can be sanitized cleanly and safely um, for, for reuse. And actually more frequent sanitization is safer than using something that is disposable, but that has passed through many hands and has never been sanitized. Um, we were also seeing that uh, the virus lasts longer on plastic than other materials. Um, and so there, there are just a lot of myths to debunk surrounding single use plastics and, uh, and COVID in particular, when we think about restaurants and dining. And I think you know, we're, we're just starting to come out of, of hiding and out of out of lockdown in different places around the world. But um, of course, uh, priority is to keep our is to keep our families safe, to keep our employees and communities safe. And um, and I think there's definitely going to be a lot of, um, you know, people are definitely going to be tentative in, in the way that they go out into the world. And so I um, want to make sure that we're not creating a new challenge by introducing so much more single use plastics back into our lives where they had been eliminated um, and where they're not needed for safety. Um, so, so that's what we're highlighting here. So we, we speak a little bit about the truth, 
Um, how does COVID-19 actually spread? Are reusable safe? How can they be safe? What prevents the spread of the virus? And how can we make sure that that's um, being accomplished in um, restaurants and hotels, in events and sports stadiums specifically? Um, and then we have specific operational recommendations around staff safety, protective equipment, um, material sourcing. So which products can be available and, and used in these different um, settings for dine-in, takeaway, room service. Um, cleaning protocols, so best practices for cleaning protocols, and all of this is really just an aggregation of knowledge um, from leading organizations like the WHO, the CDC, um, <clears throat> and governments around the world actually highlighting what regulations are, are looking like elsewhere. So um, yeah, and we, do, we do touch upon waste management as well. So, just, so that is there um, as a resource. Um, on the next slide, I just touch upon briefly what is, um, what is included. This is where I was mentioning um, some of the safety knowledge and we do have a specific fact sheet for this um, there also was a statement signed by over 125 virologists epidemiologists and health experts from around the world endorsing that reusables can be safe and reducing, endorsing that reusables are safe um, of course with the proper protocols and disinfectant methods um, and so so that is is very hopeful and this is not information we had at the beginning of the pandemic so now that we have this um, we're able to, to hopefully move forward on with our on our best foot through reopening. Um, on the next slide, um, these, these are some of the government examples I was mentioning. So some of the policies around the world that are very supportive of reusables. And we see this in Singapore, actually, the government encourages consumers to bring their own containers um, because you're responsible for cleaning and taking care of your own container. And so they felt that would be the safest response. Um, in Australia, governments, um, in the districts there have actually been very supportive of reusables and have come out with a statement saying, you know, there's no evidence to suggest any benefit in switching to disposables um, if the proper measures to prevent transmission are in place. Um, there are governments that have endorsed dishwashing and proper temperatures and protocols there. So, so there's a lot of support for this, um, but I'll, I won't go too deeply <laughs> into any of that and maybe that can come up in the discussion. Um, the next slide, uh, just as a quick overview of the some of the reusable solutions that we highlight. So these are professional reuse systems um, where where a, a professional team is handling the logistics and the washing and the management. So you know that they have to meet certain standards for um, for health and safety, and, and they always have actually. But that's just you know increased during during this period of of higher attention to that. Um, and then on the next slide, talking about uh, which is, if, if necessary, which disposables um, we would consider um, to be better than single-use plastics. Um, but also, all this is dependent on what is what waste management infrastructure is available, as we were saying, and, and we'll highlight that throughout the guide. So it really just depends on what kind of composting you have access to, what your sorting and collection looks like, and um, and how that that proceeds. Um, on the next slide, uh, just touching upon some of the smaller details. So looking at condiments and menus and payments, I think we're all kind of starting to see restaurants go into contactless methods uh, there. And, um, and that also reduces some of the labor costs too in different cases. So hopefully this is something that stays and um, we can just reduce the waste um, from that perspective. Um, on the next slide and the next couple of slides, I'll be talking a little bit about our definition of greenwashing, which I just feel is very important to include in any conversation around solutions. Um, in particular, in right now, talking about greenwashing with relation to alternatives to plastics, there's definitely a lot of greenwashing across many sectors. So here we're going to deep dive into plastic alternatives and essentially just define four primary terms. Um, so on the next slide, here we're highlighting or defining to begin with um, biodegradable. So biodegradable itself has no specific definition. There's no time frame associated um, with that term. You and I are biodegradable. Um, it doesn't exactly say how over over what period or how long it's going to take. So that's just one thing to note. Um, there are um, actually the state of California bans the use of biodegradable um, for any plastic alternatives sold within the state. And so it could be wonderful, but it also doesn't have a clear definition without more information essentially. Um, bio-based or bioplastics, this does mean that they are made out of plant-based materials rather than fossil fuels. Um, so you're moving away from <clears throat> some of that toxicity and you're, you know, you're not supporting then the fossil fuel industry and, and petrochemical, um, petrochemical industry. But at the same time, um, many of these bioplastics are actually hybrids. And so they do include 
some petrochemical material alongside the plant-based materials. Um, so, that, so you do have to be very aware and, and careful of that. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and so just really depending on the blend and the polymer, these materials could either be recyclable, compostable, or neither, and they may be landfill bound. And so we've seen just as this is very much a new area, um, we've seen a lot of research and development and trials and testing, um, but we have seen a lot of false solutions come through for that reason. Um, so it's just important to stay critical and to, to ask for more information. So just hearing that it's bio-based is not enough. Um, on the next tab, uh, next slide, we we talk about compostable plastics. And so these are plastics that are certified compostable. Um, this could also, there are also um, certifications for and testing requirements for biodegradability. And so earlier I said, you know, biodegradable on its own doesn't have much of a meaning, but if it does have a specific certification, um, then that explains what, that explains what testing requirements they, they've met essentially. So what tests have been taken? What did they see? How quickly does it break down in different conditions? Um, and again, here it, get, it does get very complicated and specific, but um, for the most part, com certified compostable plastics um, do need to be treated in a special facility, an industrial composting facility that reaches the high temperatures and times with the right bacteria in place to break that material down. So. Um, and again, I will just say that there's a lot of development in this space. So there are many compostable plastics that are coming onto the scene um, that you can compost with food waste and residential compost. It's just that has not been the norm um, in the past. Uh, so, so yeah, again, approaching this with a critical eye and focusing on what waste management systems are available is really important. Um, and this is also why, because it's so complicated, we really do just highlight reusable solutions because you can avoid this whole headache um, and just see what you can, how to reduce waste holistically. Um, the last term I'll define is recyclable plastics or, or plastics recycling essentially. And um, essentially we don't, we don't really see plastics recycling as a solution. Um, it certainly comes into the fold of the portfolio of strategies that we need to take. Um, but on its own, just thinking that recycling our way out of this, this problem, um, that will not get us there. And, and uh, for a couple of reasons, recyclable plastics recycling is, um, there's limited infrastructure around globally for plastics recycling. You may be familiar that actually in the US we had been exporting our waste to China um, and, and much of Europe had also been exporting, exporting recyclable plastics to China for them to deal with it. And eventually they just got fed up and said, no, we're not gonna deal with this anymore. If you're gonna sell, sell us pellets, we'll take them, but we don't want your junk. Um, and so we're continuing to export that waste in places like Malaysia and Brazil and South Africa. And so we're, we're exporting the problem and we do not have the infrastructure to fully handle it on our own. So I think that should be a major wake up call if we're producing more material than we can even process um, on our own shores. But um, in addition to that, there's also uh, the requirement when you recycle something, you're selling material. So there needs to be a market for somebody who wants to buy that material. And if there isn't, um, then it won't have a second life. And so for, for films and flexible plastics, for the most part, there's no market for that because people have to outweigh how expensive is it gonna be for me to repurpose this thing um, versus just buying it new. And sadly, virgin plastic is so cheap and, and accessible. So uh, in many cases, um, it's only the number ones and the, and the number two plastics that are uh, recyclable. If you look at, there is um, on, on plastics, there is a, there's the three arrow recycling symbol and you'll see numbers in the middle. So number one and number two in the US are primarily the only two that are recyclable. In some cases that includes number five. And of course, depending on where you are and what part of the city, um, that could be different, but just, just recognizing that it's a very limited amount. Um, and uh, as plastics is recycled, the last thing I'll mention on this is that it degrades with every life cycle. So you cannot take, and there are some developments that are looking into chemical ways to repurpose that material, but the way that it's currently done is it's degrading um, with each life. So you can't take a PET plastic water bottle and turn it on its own into a new water bottle without some virgin material. And so that also just means that this is not an infinite solution. There's no way this can be because we're losing value at every at every stage there. So um, just wanting to recognize the, the, the failures of, of recycling, um, even though it certainly does play a role in um, in, the, in the, our holistic approach, if we can just move away from plastic to begin with, or, or from single-use plastic in particular, um, that's what we see as a focus. 
on the good news, um, as we're talking about that, is that um, the consumer awareness is increasing even through the pandemic. People are more interested in businesses and brands representing their values. People want companies to take action. Um, actually, um, what I found to be really inspiring is, is the, uh, the, the statistic from, from the Globe Scan study that shows um, six out of 10 respondents um, under the age of 30, so this next generation, which is so exciting, say that the priority for post-pandemic recovery should be restructuring society to deal with inequality, to deal with climate change. And so we're take, we have this moment to reset and people want to see better. We don't want to see things go back to normal. We want to see us learn um, and grow from this experience. And so I think that, that desire and, and um, need for action is so powerful because um, as I mentioned earlier, that, that grassroots action and fire is really what what gets companies to take action. And so companies are very responsive to what they think consumers want to see, especially in these industries that we're focusing on, whether it's hospitality, tourism, music, sports, it's all based on the fan, the consumer, the guest. Um, so we have so much power in that in that role. Um, and of course we have so much power in political systems as well um, and exercising that further and, and engaging with our elected officials and representatives there. Um, uh, two more slides here, just talking about actions that we can take. So here are some actions that, that we recognize that, you know, things that you can do in your own life, bringing a reusable water bottle. Um, I know most people are just grounded at home, so that probably has led to a, a large reduction of waste um, in, in some aspects, but also um, probably have been an increase in ordering takeout. Um, and so when you do order takeout, make sure that you're saying if, if this is available to you that you don't want cutlery um, and giving feedback to businesses and restaurants if they're giving you cutlery unnecessarily or unneeded condiments and extra um, cups and extra packaging that you just don't need because we're all sitting at home and have these materials available. So that's one, one way to really reduce waste and to celebrate businesses as they do that while saving money because they're using fewer materials. Um, and then the next slide is, as we talk about policy, there is currently a federal uh, policy, this is in the US, um, called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act um, that has been proposed, um, which has been, which has received a lot of input from leading um, environmental nonprofits and leading experts in the space who've been working on this for, for their careers. And so it's really exciting to see the focus on reuse and refill, holding companies accountable, environmental justice, um, looking at what real recycling could look like, just reducing pollution, reducing single use, managing our own waste um, at home and not exporting that. So touching upon many of the challenges that, that I've highlighted here today. And so it, this has just been reintroduced um, and, and into, in, um, into this, this year's agenda. And we actually just hosted a rally yesterday or um, Two days ago <laughs> with uh, with our friends at Oceana to highlight the reintroduction of this bill um, and ways that we can take action um, um, as, as individuals is to reach out to our representatives and ask them to sign on and so you can see who has signed on um, at, on the official bill uh, posting um, <clears throat> but you can also regardless even if you just send a note to your your Congress reps, your your senators representing your state, um, to let them know that you are interested in every every outreach that they receive. So um, that does go a long way, and that's actually the way that policy has been put into place um, throughout our history. So uh, yeah, so take action on the Break from Plastic Pollution Act. Take action in your own lives. Um, and on the next slide, our 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 motto or our slogan at Oceana Global has evolved to be care deeply, and so essentially just encouraging people to care about their, themselves, their community, the planet that we're on, um, aquatic animals, as we as we focus on aquatic animals today and the role that they play and exist in this broader system. Um, and on the last slide, I've got my email and information available here. So please don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything we don't touch upon in the discussion today as well. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kathy. Lightning presentation. We are going to now move into the Q and A session. Um, as a reminder, we do have some existing questions that people shot through. Um, but if you have any questions that come to mind right now, feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll try to get them all answered. Um, our first question um, says here: um, 
how can we make these complicated problems understand to old people that sometimes they make more influence on decision making in society so it would become easy to propagate a good consciousness in our society? That's a good question. Um, I know I, I kind of did focus on, on the younger generation that, that is aware of this and taking action. Um, we also tend to be a millennial focused nonprofit in the way that we operate. But one thing that I do think can be really powerful is, um, and this might, this, might, <laughs> this might seem like I'm going down a different path, but um, is youth education. And actually for that reason, because, um, because kids take this knowledge home with them and they influence their, their parents, their grandparents. Um, if they're the ones who are active and, and talking about how we can be bringing reusable bags to the grocery store or you know, encouraging parents to, to take action in different ways or asking about how waste should be sorted and how come we're creating so much waste. All of those questions, especially when they're coming from your own kids or your own grandkids can be really empowering and or are impactful. And so, um, so we definitely do work with a lot of youth education organizations and with a lot of schools um, for that reason to, to get to those older generations through the younger generations. Um, in general, I think uh, the older generations who are in positions of power may be more responsive to some of that consumer demand that I was talking about. So um, the, the CEO of a hospitality group that we'll see that people are asking and demanding for change. And so we're starting to see actually different hotels commit to getting rid of the single use plastic um, uh, bottles for shampoo, conditioner and, and, and body wash that they're called small format bottles um, for shower amenities. And so that caused enough outrage um, at, at the consumer level that they're really starting to respond and to take action, even though it's not easy for them to find those solutions and they have to juggle through certain health and safety challenges and requirements there and um, and seeing what materials are available, but but they are starting to do that because um, because they feel that they have to, that they'll, they'll need to to stay relevant. Enough other businesses are taking action that if they don't, they'll be left behind. And so I think that's another way to, to engage people of different generations. Um, if they don't have an altruistic intention, it also can just be about uh, business. It can it can just be for, for risk management as policy is being put in place. Um, it can also be for health. I spoke a bit about human health. And so this does physically impact our bodies and, and our communities. And so that's something that people are responsive to. Um, the decrease in, in male fertility is a very new study, but that's something that's created a lot of outrage and shock, um, but also immediate action. And so, um, yeah. Our next question is how has your company worked or have any plans to work with real taste real retail stores to find substitutes for plastic bags yes absolutely that's a great question um and that's a really challenging one on um, the substitutes for plastic bags um actually I, i'd also want to point to um closed loop partners and they have just hosted a beyond the bag challenge so if you search beyond the bag challenge you'll most likely find that i do apologize as i'm on my phone i would Normally just pop that in the chat there, but um, they, they have a whole, and this happened just recently, actually a couple of months ago, I think last month, they announced the, the finalists there um, for that cohort, but um, they received so many different ideas about how we can get rid of these plastic bags um, in the grocery store, in general stores, department stores, um, and uh, a lot of them were reusable, which is really exciting to see. So there were a lot of different ideas on how we could be achieving that um, in a reusable way. Um, beyond just putting the onus on the, the consumer. Oh, great. Um, beyond just putting the onus on the consumer um, to to just bring their own bag, but ways for uh, for stores themselves to be providing a sort of a deposit system. So you're, you're, you're putting down a deposit, you get this reusable bag and you get to use it again and you get your deposit back when you return it. Um, and so creative ways of doing that also reusable inserts you can put directly in the shopping cart so that you, you're ready to go at the end of checkout and you can just grab your bag and go. Um, creative ways to have bags turn into bracelets or be very easy to care, carry around. Um, there are also developments on the um, comp genuine compostable plastic uh, material R&D side of things where there are bags that people are creating out of cassava um, that are truly water soluble. And I've actually used some of these and I put a wet swimsuit and it almost burned a hole through the bottom <laughs> after a while. Um, so it, it, there, you know, there are some that are genuinely designed to be very temporary, um, made out of plant-based materials and designed to go back into the ocean and into 
the environment in, in safe and non-toxic ways. Um, so that is that is also an option. But I think, as we were saying too, just because of the complexity surrounding some of those those solutions, we really do focus on reusables as much as we can. Um, and so, yeah, so I would say, you know, take a look at those those solutions and what people are doing. And and we are seeing different companies starting to play. Right. So Co Kroger and others are, are looking and asking for those solutions. Um, uh, but, you know, still trying to figure out which way to go. Yeah. It really is fun to see the uh, interesting ways people are trying to find uh, ways to make their own reusable bags. Yeah. Um, we so the next question is. Um, this is one's a little specific. What do you make of Honolulu's recent disposable food wear ordinance? Is this type of disposable cutlery prohibition likely to be applied in other communities? And if not, how might business owners be incentivized to utilize plastic free cutlery, food storage, or even strive to be disposable free? Yeah, no, this is this is fantastic. Um, and actually, yeah, very inspired by, by what Hawaii and, and what Honolulu is is putting forward there um, in, in that ban on single use plastics. Um, and, and that's very similar to what I was mentioning, those ban on single use plastics around the world. So Barbados had a very similar ban on single use plastics. And I think um, we're also starting to see this more pop up in more touristic regions where there is um, uh, typically, right, under normal, normal, normal circumstances, this last year notwithstanding, um, a large population of tourists that are not residential and um, are coming in with, with a high demand. Um, to, to frequent and patron those, those businesses that would be offering um, <clears throat> single use foodware. And so that is where, honestly, I feel that groups like ourselves come in and, and we're not the only ones who are doing, who are offering this support. There are fantastic organizations around the world. Some of those that we partner with that are our community partners on the ground, but um, businesses, I think it really starts with education. So highlighting the greenwashing that we spoke about today so that people are not shifting from single use plastics to um, things like PLA and cornstarch, just to call out a few specific materials um, where there is no commercial composting on the island. So what I've actually seen a lot of in Honolulu is those like um, PLA and, and, and cornstarch and other commercially compostable plastic items used for cups and cutlery and takeaway containers, um, which cannot be processed here because there is no facility to process that here. So, um, and, and that's what we're seeing in Barbados too. So that's what will happen if we're not able to jump in and offer genuine solutions and to show, um, to, to focus on reusables, to incentivize reusables and to show that reusables can be cost saving. So even though they may feel um, more cost intensive at the beginning, there are ways to recoup that cost, um, but also to highlight other disposable solutions as they become more available, um, solutions that are wooden and fiber-based and, um, and able to be com composted with food waste ultimately. So you can have one bin for food waste and for those materials. And so that could be treated um, uh, more easily and accessibly. And, and ideally making sure with everything that there are no non-toxics in, in your foodware, which can be really challenging. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think so in short, education, making sure businesses know um, what solutions are available. And in this case, here here in Hawaii, like which groups are offering those solutions? How can they support local economies and communities um, while they're making those transitions? Um, and then also just to celebrate that it is feasible and possible and in many cases, cost saving. So um, yeah, I, I mean, that that's just the work <laughs> that needs to continue. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cassia, so much for outlining for all of us just the seriousness of the issue, um, ways that we can all help out, and kind of what the future looks like in terms of banning plastics from our ocean and kind of the role we can all play. Um, that's about the amount of time we have for this session. Um, as you guys saw, Cassia did put her email, so feel free to shoot her any additional follow-up questions, or you can reach out to Amy or Kathy and they can follow uh, your questions onto Cassia. Um, we are now going to take a brief 10 minute break and then we will start our next session at, at 12. Cassia, thank you again so much. Um, I wish you all the best and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Awesome. Thanks, Jackson. And thanks all. Take care.